Hi, I'm Kay Lemon, Executive Director of the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, nonprofit MSI serves as the bridge between marketing theory and business practice, and our primary goal is to move the needle on significant marketing problems. We do this by funding research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted on by our 70 plus corporate sponsors and disseminating that research through members only events and a variety of publications. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another MSI for members by members webinar. This is a series of webinars on subjects related to MSI's current research priority topics. First, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have for Jerry during the presentation. We'll gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentations. Also, Jerry's slides, as well as the entire webinar, will be available for download on the MSI member website. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Jerry Smith, professor at Boston College's Carroll School of Management, has kindly agreed to present today's webinar on winning consumer-driven brand loyalty in an age of opt-out. Uh, Gerald Smith, uh, Dr. Gerald Smith, is a business professor and former chair of the marketing faculty at BC's Carroll School of Management, where he also leads the MBA product and brand management specialization and the brand management partners program. He's long been an advisor in brand management and pricing to firms in almost every industry represented by MSI. He's going to talk to us about his latest book, so I'll hold off on that for a moment. But I want to say his research has appeared in all of marketing's top journals. He's received best paper awards. He's a longtime friend of MSI. And most important, um, Jerry is a wonderful colleague and mentor to me, and we've worked together for 15 years at Boston College, and I'm truly honored to have Jerry present today as part of the MSI webinar series. I think you're really going to love what he has to talk about. So Jerry, welcome. Thank you, Kay, and it is great to be with you all today. Uh, I am just uh, going to queue up my slides here on the system to make sure that we are in good shape. Um, and so can you see my slides okay? Yes, I perfect. Excellent. So thank you very much, uh, Kay, and to Selena and to MSI for the opportunity to share my research on opt-out and winning consumer-driven brand loyalty in an age of opt-out, which is really where we are now as we transition into the digital economy of the 21st century. Uh, my research appears here in the book, The Opt-Out Effect, Marketing Strategies that Empower Consumers and win customer-driven brand loyalty. And my publisher, Pearson FT Press, has given us a URL and a discount. For those of you who are participating in the seminar today, you can get a 35% uh, discount off of the book if you buy it through the publisher and use the opt-out 35 code shown here. So use that and get a good, good price on a, on a copy of the book. So let's talk about the uh, about the topic for today. So my research was based on uh, really three primary areas. I did a consumer survey with 406 consumers responding, a brand marketer survey that was done in parallel asking as much as possible the same questions, certainly the same themes, to try and understand how consumers viewed the digital revolution versus marketers and how they viewed the revolution. And we had uh, 219 marketers participate, and that was a fairly broadly representative sample from C-level participants down to marketing managers. Uh, then, we ha then I did depth interviews with a team of MBA students and uh, with brand managers, with digital managers, and with agency leaders. So this was the Boston College Empowered Customer Study of 2015. And the question was, what is the impact of digital on the customer and brand relationship. The, the finding, certainly the most important finding, overarching finding, is that we are living in an age of the empowered customer. Customers know more today than they have ever have, and I'm convinced that they know as much as and often more than marketers. Uh, they, ha they are empowered because of search knowledge, because they can get knowledge on anything, anywhere with a click of, of a mouse, 
or, a, or pointing on a tablet. They have mobile agility where they can look up this information anywhere, at retail, uh, at a restaurant, wherever, and they are socially connected to people throughout the world uh, that are interested in this. The real question is, if consumers are so empowered, I'm convinced that they know more than retail salespeople when you walk into a store. They know more than distributors, and they know more often than the manufacturers themselves because they know of brand alternatives locally or internationally that the brands, brand managers never would have thought of. So how do we deal with these customers? I'm convinced that the answer is that we empower them more and give them the assets, the digital assets that enable them to manage their lives. We see symptoms of this. This was a, this was a survey done on how, what consumers expect uh, if, they post a, if they do a social media post. 32% expect a response within 30 minutes. 42 expect a response within 60 minutes. 57% say that they want the same response, whether it's at night or on the weekends. I must say that I use this myself. If I have trouble with a company, I will tweet out my frustration, and I usually get a response back overnight, and then I establish a digital relationship with a company that is usually far more productive than doing something by telephone. This is Jerry Wynn from the Horton School. Uh, Jerry said, this changing world has led to a new breed of consumers. They expect customization, make it mine. Communities, let me be part of it. Multiple channels, let me call, click, or visit. Competitive value, give me more for my money. And choice, give me search and decision tools. The era of the passive consumer is history. Empowered consumers are increasingly in control, which dramatically changes the role of marketing. This shift in relationship between consumers and companies is the most fundamental change in the history of marketing, even more dramatic than the historic shift from a product orientation to a market orientation. I want you to notice when Jerry Wynn said this. This was 2008, so this is seven or eight years ago. This is, I guess, nine years ago now. This is impressive that Jerry was that kind of a prophet to see where we are today, but it is really true. So one of the questions, obviously, uh, the, the title of the book is opt-out, and so how much opt-out is going on out there? We asked of the marketers, what is happening with you and your customer base? And we asked them the question, how much of your customer base is now not marketable via email due to opt-out or incomplete or outdated records? And we gave them a series of responses. I made the cutoff here greater than 40%, so greater than 40% of your database is no longer available due to opt-out and these other factors. You can see looking across, the B2C average, 24% of companies said that 40% or more of their database was inaccessible now. As you look across, credit cards, 54% of their database is, is, is inaccessible. Insurance, 39%, and so on and so forth opt-out is a huge factor in marketing and in the economy today. So what is going on with opt-out? Um, one of the questions that I asked what it was, do consumers receive too many messages? And I want you to see the disconnect here between marketers and consumers. Do market, what do marketers say is, do consumers receive too many messages? It's not really that big a deal. 80% said, no, it's not a big deal. 21% said, yes, they do receive too, ma too many messages. Look at consumers. 44% say, absolutely, too many emails. 57%, too many pop-up and banner ads. Look at the difference between marketers and consumers. What are the reasons for opting out? Once again, marketers say, well, it depends. I mean, you know, it could be it's not relevant or people didn't request or sign up. What do consumers say? Actually, Frequency, how many emails are they getting from the company? That is the number one by far, 38%. Uh, or they did not request or sign up. Permission, that is we didn't give you the marketer permission. And then number three is relevancy. It simply wasn't relevant. One of the key theses that I explore in the book is how marketers really have not embraced digital like consumers have. Consumers have embraced it because they have apps, and they have smartphones in their hands, and they have tablets, 
and they love to explore and they love to play with the new technology. On the other hand, marketers are just catching up. They're worried about legal issues with social media. They're worried about just how to stay in the game. Really, we have to reorient the way, the way we go about digital and consumers. There are three classes of opt-out that I've discovered in my research. Um, one is explicit opt-out. And explicit opt-out are those who formally unsubscribe. You've done this before. You receive an email and you go down and you click unsubscribe. But that's not all that's going on. There are also silent opt-outers. Those are people who actually take the time to block or to flag this email as junk or spam, and therefore you are removed from the list permanently. Silent opt-out that they do on the site, and they never tell you about it. And then number three is behavioral opt-out. These are people who delete or ignore the message. Most of us do that. We simply delete or ignore it. And in fact, as I've done my research, I calculated how frequently these happen. And as consumers, when you are presented with, say, an annoying email, what do you do? 30% say that they explicitly opt out. By the way, these are rounded up numbers, and I've done several studies on these, so I'm simply using these for illustration purposes, but they come out to this number, roughly to this area. 30% are explicit opt outs, 10% say that they silently opt out, and 40% say that they behaviorally opt out. If you now translate that into what the true impact of opt out is, you can see here, if 10,000 people explicitly opt out, then another 3,333 will silently opt out, and another 13,333 will behaviorally opt out, and our true opt-out then, we estimate, would be about 26,000 or 27,000 people. By the way, what I'm doing here is something that you could do with your customer base very easily and ask these same questions. What do you do when you are presented with an annoying email or with an annoying pop-up? Explicitly opt-out or silently or behaviorally opt-out? And I do talk about in the book, by the way, it does depend upon how you ask the question, whether you give them the opportunity to check all of those or whether to check just one of those, okay? Millennials especially are digitally native, and this, of course, is the coming market that will be so important in the early 21st century. Millennials are very particular. They seldom are influenced at all by advertising they swim in the oceans of the digital world. They're very native to it. Uh, they often review blogs before purchasing. They rarely go to television news or magazines or books. They value authenticity more than just content. They're open to engaging with brands on social networks. 62% of millennials say that if a brand engages with them on social, they're more likely to become a loyal customer. They're interested in co-creating products with companies. Think of how important this is. They want to get into the brand manager suite and become a co-creator. And they use multiple tech devices multiple times throughout the day. No surprise, we all do that. So this has led to an interesting insight, what I call customer-driven brand loyalty. And this is really the opposite of traditional brand loyalty that we've grown up with. Um, as we look at millennials, 95% or more of millennials say that they want their brands to court them actively. Uh, Deloitte did a study just a year ago, and they reported that uh, once again, three years straight, brand loyalty is declining significantly. This was interesting from, uh, from a Gartner report they said that a recent study by Kite Wheel, an experience vendor, suggests that 73% of consumers feel loyalty programs should be a way for brands to show how loyal they are to them as customers. On the other hand, marketers, 66% of marketers, believe that loyalty programs are ways for customers to show how loyal they are to the business. Once again, this consumer versus marketing disconnect. Here's an example of customer-driven brand loyalty. This was Jeff Jacobs, a Twitter conversation from Culver's. That's a burger chain uh, in the Midwest and in the South of the, of the US. 
so Jeff Jacobs says, thanks Culver's, Greenville, South Carolina, for a double butter bacon burger delivered in the drive through lane, except that I ordered a tenderloin. Uh, they tweeted back from Culver's, whoops, we're sorry, would you please give us the details here, they give him the URL, so that we can help make this right, and thanks. Uh, Jeff says, done, and thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts, and they tweet back, we appreciate you reaching out. Since we goofed, your next value basket is on us, and then follow this for details. The story doesn't end there. Jeff Jacobs got a call back on his cell phone that night from the store manager apologizing. He got a call back from corporate headquarters the next day apologizing. So you can see customers are in a position here of considerable power, and Culver's is wisely tracking these customers and making sure that they're in sync with the customers. This is customer-driven brand loyalty. Customers are driving this bus. Here are shifting paradigms in the customer brand relationship. The one that we've all grown up with is brand-driven loyalty. This is the traditional economy. It is brand-centric. It is a branded product and service with few touch points. The brand persuasion model, we've been taught how to persuade consumers that ours is the best brand. We are strategic about the brand. We have passive customers. We have standardized products, and then we mass replicate those products. This has been a model for so many years. Customer relationship management is so important, and we've dealt with attitudinal marketing strategies, especially loyalty that drives loyalty. In the new paradigm, customer-driven loyalty is now reversed. It is a digital economy. It is customer-centric. The focus now is customer experiences, many touch points, Customer consideration set model. I want to be in the customer's consideration set so that when he or she reaches for an answer, they come to me first, they go to my app, or I'm at least in their set. They are empowered customers, and the brand now is an omnipresent brand, always where the customer is. Personalized, customized, co-create, as I mentioned earlier, and now customer-managed experience. Customers want to manage, want to create their own experiences. And then this is significant, conative marketing strategies and engagement, not attitudinal. Conative is all about the world of doing and acting. Uh, these are, this is what people now want to do with, with digital. They want to act, they want to enact, they want to create. This is all about doing and engaging. I have to say, by the way, I experienced this, one of my hobbies is sailing. It used to be that I would go to a magazine and look for information on sailing or go to one of the marine stores. Now I, or even go to say the Weather Channel or even the Weather Channel app to get, uh, to get you know, wind information and so forth. Now I have 15 apps on my iPhone and I can access any one of them. I have iHurricane on there, I have tides, I have buoys. I have, the, I have the weather channel, but I also have sail flow for other better wind forecasting conditions. I can go to any one of those. That's the idea. It is my customer experience, and you, the brand, somehow want to be part of my consideration set. How does this affect this whole opt-out picture? How does it affect um, the financial, what is the financial impact of this on customers? It is truly diminished customer lifetime value. And in the book, chapter three is called The New Look of Loyalty. I talk about the impact on customer lifetime value. Here I've shown a CLV curve for a customer. Obviously, if they opt out prematurely, then we lose all of that, uh, then we lose all of that cash flow that could have accrued, accrued from the customer over time. I show in the book formulas, this is one of the formulas here, uh, the infinite CLV calculation and uh, shows that customer lifetime value is equal to the customer contribution times and then what I call the retention multiplier, uh, which you can see here, which is retention divided by one plus the interest rate or discount rate minus R, the retention rate, then minus AC. The retention multiplier shows how important opting out is or how important retention is. In this slide, you can see, for example, that I have the top two cohorts. Uh, this is for GoJerry.com, a fictional company. 
Cohort number six has annual customer contribution of $96 and an annual retention rate of 92%. I'm using here a discount rate of 10%. Notice the retention multiplier is 5.11. That's very high because of the, driven by the annual retention of 92%. Customer lifetime value is $490.67 with a lifetime of 12.5 periods. On the other hand, look at uh, co customer cohort number two. They have three times the customer contribution, $330, a lower uh, annual retention rate of 65%. That translates into a retention multiplier of 1.44, and therefore a lower customer lifetime value. Retention is so important, and therefore opt-out is so essential. So what are the keys then to, to customer-driven loyalty? This is actually a model that is kind of a centerpiece of Chapter 4 and a centerpiece of how I go about this. We're probably familiar with some of these topics, uh, customer-centric, customer experience, customer engagement, but customer-managed is one that we haven't thought about before. Customer-centric customer is alignment and need-driven and value-driven, that is, how are our customers value, how, how valuable are our customers to us, which ones are valuable, and how are we valuable to our customers? What value do we deliver? We need to align with that, organizationally align that with that. Customer experience, how do customers experience the brand? What are the touch points that they, where they interact with us? What are the journeys? Which journeys are high value journeys and which journeys are low value journeys? How does the customer interact with the brand? Not just what the brand does, but how do customers experience the brand? A great example of this, by the way, is Apple and Apple Store. They have really mastered, in my opinion, the how of how to shop in a retail store. If you go to an Apple retail store, they have that so carefully scripted. If you ask one of their people a question, they give you an answer that sounds so intelligent but it is carefully scripted by Apple so that you experience Apple. Whether you're in Arlington, Virginia, or in Boston, or in San Francisco, you get the same kind of terrific response. Number three, customer engagement. This is so essential in digital. Listening to customers, as we saw with Culver's, engaging to act. It is about engaging. It is encouraging in customers to act, to use, to give them the digital assets that enable them to use your brand and to interact with your brand, and then to create and to enact. You've probably seen examples of this. Uh, for example, Nike has a photo ID app where you can actually take a picture of something that you really like, a sunset, say, and you can Instagram it to Nike, and they will create shoes with the colors that you thought were so brilliant in that sunset. That is creating and enacting and so valuable. And then finally, this is the missing piece to the puzzle, customer managed. Now, I have to be careful here. I'm not sure how many customers really want to manage, but customers really do want to have control over their environment. They want to choose. They want to customize. They want to do preferences, although they don't do preferences very often. So it's very interesting, you know. Uh, they definitely want this. All of this comes together into CMEX, Customer Managed Experience. So we've grown up in a world of traditional brand managers. I'm teaching a class right now that is called Strategic Brand Management, and several, uh, several modules in the course are called Classic Brand Management. This is classic stuff that we learned in the 80s and 90s and then the 2000s. Uh, ma brand managers are taught how to manage messaging strategy, product design strategy, social media, pricing, service, and retail. They are given the commission to develop and to make sure that what is delivered to customers is, in, is consistent with strategy. Our execution must be consistent with that. Now we're in a new world. It is a customer-driven model, customer-driven Brand management, what does that mean? Well, we have now, we still have brand strategy that is so essential and brand execution, but now 
We're interested in brand messaging relationships with the customer. Notice how that's different than just messaging. Or brand product relationship, that's different than just product design. The customer wants to be involved with the product. There's a relationship now, brand social relationship rather than just social media. Or brand financial relationship rather than just pricing. Or brand service relationship or the brand retail relationship. I want the store to be the kind of store that I want to go to. I cite in the book how Macy's is brilliant at customer service. This was Pete Fader down at Fortin that noted this. Um, brilliant at customer service. They know, me th they know me when I come in by name. But one of the things that Pete said was, we have to go further and understand who this customer is through our analytics that tells me a deeper history, a deeper portrait of who they are. We have to go further than that. So the real question is here, in the middle is digital customer relationship. And I put digital in parentheses, moving ever closer to digital as we move into the digital economy fully. Who is the brand manager in the middle? Is it the brand manager? Maybe not. Maybe it's the customer. The customer wants to be in the brand manager suite. The customer wants to do this stuff. The customer wants to manage the message relationship, wants to manage the social relationship. Where's the brand manager? The brand manager is there as part of the brand management team, driving strategy, driving execution. But the customer now has to be a part of that, of that customer relationship and driving that relationship. This was a comment from, um, from one of the chief digital officers that we interviewed in the study. Today, brand managers are completely emasculated. I love this, this great quote. Powerless. In the, late, in the 1970s and 1980s, brand managers made ads, one 30-second ad. They did one commercial. They then did a simple media placement on one television show like MASH. Brands used to shout. Consumers used to listen. Consumers now say, ask me. Consumers are the brand managers. They say, let me tell you what I like. Let me and my 10 million friends tell you, my 100, my 100 friends, times their 100 friends, times their 100 friends, and so on. It's the best free focus group ever. Brands, unfortunately, are not defining the brand now. They are just starting it. Consumers are the authors, the developers, the marketers. It's the reason reality shows are everywhere. We will tell you a good story. It's why seven times more people voted for season 10 of American Idol than for the President of the United States. I think this was a very, very insightful, a very important insight that consumers are now the authors. We give them the brand and consumers will now make that what they want the brand to be for them. Who's doing this and who's doing it well? Uh, this is an example from Hasbro. Hasbro has the Monopoly franchise. Hasbro does this very well. I mean, if you guys know Monopoly, uh, Monopoly is, I think it goes back to 1935, truly an old brand. Uh, but when we talked with the brand managers there, they had fully embraced a whole digital model. This was a good example of where they were now questioning how should we retire some of the tokens that we use? Because they're really old, like they have a wheelbarrow and they have an iron, you know, an iron really is from the 1930s. So they said, how should we do this? Well, we could do this as a brand team, but no, let's not do that. Let's now take this out to our customers and see what they want to do. So they went to Facebook and they asked them, so which of these tokens should we retire? They gave them the whole list of tokens. And now they have here, here are new tokens that we should consider uh, to add in and replace the retired one. The winner was the cat. And you can imagine as they do this, this isn't just so, you know, this is on Facebook where people are posting, you know, responses and responses to responses. You know, this is going viral as we try to debate who we should keep and who, and who we should uh, let go. So the cat was the winner, and do you know who the loser was? It was the iron, okay, truly the old iron. So Hasbro has done a good job here with Monopoly. They've done this with many of their other products, and I was impressed as I saw their work. 
This is L'Oreal out of New York. Um, L'Oreal does the Makeup Genius app. So this is an app where you can download this onto your smartphone or onto your tablet. And, um, and you can upload your image, and now you can try on virtually any kind of makeup. Uh, instantly apply makeup to your own reflection in real time. The makeup follows your face as you move. So you can choose from an endless variety of different kinds of, uh, of, kinds of looks that they have. This is brilliant. Uh, so far, at least when I last looked, which was about three or four months ago, L'Oreal had, had downloaded, or consumers had downloaded, 14 million copies of the Makeup Genius app. The point is here is that they're giving their consumers this digital asset that enables consumers then to engage with their brand, to engage with their brand is so important. Uh, Lego. Lego is actually a master at this kind of uh, digital management. And as one that came up as we were interviewing other brand managers, they cited Lego as being very good. This is sort of a tip of the iceberg type of thing where this was with the birth of the royal, uh, you know, the royal couple a couple of years ago. And, uh, and Lego sent out this Instagram you know, with their cute little Lego figures uh, you know, configured into a little royal family here. But Legos has done a lot more than that. If you're all familiar with the Lego products, uh, but they also have Lego apps, various kinds of Lego apps. They have Lego websites. They have Lego community forums where uh, members of what they call AFOLs, A-F-O-L-S, which is adult, Oh, I forgot it now. Anyway, adult fans of Legos. There we go. You know, where they now can post their own creations, including their own programmed creations. So Lego has done a great job with this. People interacting with, um, with the brand. So next steps. What do we do? Um, go back to the CMEX model, customer centric. First of all, is your brand organizationally aligned? so that it is customer-centric. I know that many companies say that, yes, we are customer-centric, but think about that and think what it means. There was a good article, uh, a good interview that just came out with John Chambers from Cisco, published by McKinsey just a week or two ago. If you didn't get it, you should get a copy of it. And, and uh, Chambers was talking about how Cisco has reoriented themselves so that they are much more customer-centric, which has meant actually making their organizational structure much flatter, more horizontal, um, oriented around customers. Uh, Cisco has always had a famous sales force that has been organized around selling great routers and great kinds of telecom equipment. Uh, they've, they've reorganized that now into customer-centric groups. And uh, all of that in the process, by the way, they ended up letting go, I think they said about 5,000 people as they did that. Some of, the, some of the people couldn't quite, you know, couldn't quite get the hang of the new customer-centric mode, but by golly, this is something that's really important. Organizational alignment. Number two, digital assets that empower. Uh, journeys and touch points, we have to give customers the digital assets that will empower them. And it's really interesting. We're now at an age, um, one of the things that I noticed as I, as I did the interviews here was how many of the brand managers were really sort of behind, behind the times. They would say, you know, like we have a Facebook page and we're really proud of it. Uh, you know, and another person, this would really struck me with one of the companies. They said, actually, the way we manage digital right now is that we manage social interactions all through our public affairs group. And then we have our brand management. They do traditional brand management stuff. And then we have a digital ad agency over here on the side. I said, why do you have your public affairs group doing it? They said, because they're the people that have the time and they typically manage those relationships and they're also connected to legal. We want to make sure that what we communicate is legally okay. Wow, that really slows them down. The brand managers were really frustrated that they couldn't move ahead because we're sort of stuck with this question about how to deal with social media. Uh, so we have to reorganize the way we interact with customers, give them the assets that, that empower them and that enable them. Uh, one of the things that I cite in the book was that um, 
many companies are satisfied with the website they have. It may be a Gen 1 or a Gen 2 website. They see it's a perfectly good website. Actually, consumers have moved beyond that. Consumers have now moved on to apps, uh, and that means even going beyond mobile optimized websites. Consumers have moved beyond that now to truly having apps and these digital app and these digital assets. In fact, they call it the appification of the web. We're now trying to make the web more appified. Uh, number three, customer engagement, digital engagement, and co-creation. I mentioned earlier Nike, um, Adidas, is it Adidas? No, New Balance does the same thing with a new NB1 where you can create your own shoe online. We need to now get involved with bringing customers into the brand management suite. But this one, the final one, is customer-driven preference management. And this is still very early in preference management. One of the things that I discovered in the research here was that 70% of marketers say that they actually offer a good preference management capability on their websites. Only 30% of customers say that they ever do preference management. That's a big disconnect. So consumers find, you know, what's, what's causing this disconnect? I think that preference management is still too early. Companies haven't quite figured out how to do it. They haven't figured out how to do it so that customers feel like it's something that they want to do. And yet customers want to control their, especially the privacy issues with the brand and especially the messaging issues with the brand. So we really have to figure that out. Customer-driven preference management is where we need to go next. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, and you can see that here is my email address and then also the website for the book, the Opt-Out Effect book. And uh, so thanks very much for, uh, for hanging in. It was delightful to have you here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Jer Jerry, that was great. Um, I learned a lot in that uh, 35 minutes, and I think that our audience has well. Um, we've got several questions, and so let me kind of um, uh, start you off with one. Um, one actually was looking at, have you looked into the effects um, of ad blocking software or the installation of ad blocking? And where would that, you know, I, I, I think the question is kind of where would that fit in your opting out hierarchy? And what role do you see that that's going to play as we move forward with this empowered consumer? That's a really good question. And ad blocking, actually, um, I haven't measured it in the research per se, but certainly have studied it. And especially with the introduction of, o of iOS 9 by Apple this last year, um, ad blocking apps quickly shot to the top of the charts. Uh, the Peace app in particular by Marco Arment, who also created Tumblr, uh, he took that to the top of the, of the, um, of the App Store charts and then he took it down 36 hours later because he knew that it had the potential to literally destroy brands because so many brands are dependent upon advertising. It definitely is part of opt-out. And it shows, again, how consumers are embracing these tools that enable them to try and manage the messaging. So consumers actually do want messaging, but they want the ability to manage it. And if you're going to give me the kind of incessant messaging that you give me, I'll block ads from it. But that's actually another good extension of research that we need to do because how many consumers really do want ad blocking, complete ad blocking, because obviously if you do that, then you also block out other cookies and other ways for brands to be able to tailor their messaging and their product design and development for you. So it's certainly part of opt-out and it's an extension that I haven't really explored in detail yet but certainly have looked at it uh, just as it's appeared, especially in the last kind of year. So good question. Oh, well, that, that's great. And related to that then, uh, there was a question that arose that said, can you speak a little bit about what you've learned and what your thoughts are in terms of content marketing and brand publishing as it relates to this future of brand marketing? Given that our traditional approaches to push marketing, say, may be obsolete, um, what do you envision the future of uh, content marketing and really kind of getting, you know, how do you see brands may be able to have their content out there so that consumers can drive their relationships? 
So that's a really good question. Um, content marketing is going from centralized to decentralized. So uh, part of this is UGC, user-generated content. And so you know, there are many companies that do this very well. Uh, Doritos has had the Crash the Super Bowl campaign uh, for about 10 years now, and they're actually going to discontinue it. Uh, you know, so uh, Coca-Cola has done a good job with that. I cite them. Uh, that's, but that's only part of UGC is only part of the picture. Uh, brands also now need to do different kinds of content management. For example, uh, Johnson & Johnson has their Clean & Clear Acne brand, and uh, you know, they sort of wrestled with how to deal with content. And they finally sat down and they said, you know, there is some content that is really consequential and that we really want to make sure that that is content that comes out of us and that has our brand stamp on it and that is carefully kind of created by us. Um, on the other hand, there's content that is sort of social content and uh, we're not going to manage that quite so carefully. And then there is content actually where consumers come to the website really to kind of learn about how to use the product, you know. And so they created three categories of content, and I thought, it made, I thought it made a lot of sense. They had what they called hero content, and then they had hub content, which is sort of the social kind of stuff, and then they had help content, which is really their own YouTube channel where people can go and view YouTube content, you know, about how to, do the, how to use the product in this way or another. Uh, but the hero content I thought was especially interesting. They went from putting out, say, a few really good commercials a year to putting out 120 carefully curated hero content videos a year. You know? So it's a different model, and it puts the brand manager in a different role of not just creating commercials, but now creating a di sort of different classes of content. By the way, the other thing I like about this as an example is that they managed to sort of work through some of these legal issues. You've got to go to your legal team and say, listen, we need to have the flexibility to move with consumers in this space. Let's define what is acceptable and let's define where we need to be careful about it. But we need to kind of get in front of those issues. So I hope that that answers your question. Sure. Jerry, that, that is very cool. And um, I know we have uh, several academics who are listening now, and I think that what I also hear you saying is that we need new research in this area of content. Uh, and MSI is thinking about that. It's emerging in the new research priorities as well. And I love this notion of can we identify what content is consequential and what different roles, different types of content play. I think there, we need some really smart people to work on that. Um, let me move into another area that um, somewhat relates to that, and it popped up. Uh, I, I'd use your L'Oreal example. Uh, this question of um, how do you be consistent with your brand message and create these consistent experiences um, for your customer base, while at the same time really being personalized and tailored. And let me just take that question further, a new question that came up is understanding the role of data analytics in all this. So somehow is it possible to target millions of customers um, and perhaps customize our experience, the experience that those customers have using data analytics to help us deal with this opt-out? So this whole notion of, you know, you kind of have talked a little bit in your content about the the single message versus multiple message messages. But so one is the strategic consistency versus personalization, and the other is how can data analytics perhaps actually allow us to be much more tailored? Yeah, I, so obviously I, I haven't talked about analytics here very much, but that is absolutely critical. And uh, so I really I see three key areas here. I see analytics. And then I see engagement, which is sort of social engagement. And then I see content uh, and helping users create content as well as us, you know, sort of giving them platforms that they can use our content. Um, I think we're going into a digital world, as I mentioned earlier, where the brand is omnipresent. And so this means that when I go into a store, say that I walk into Home Depot, 
and there's an eye beacon, an LE beacon that is sitting by the door, and it sort of says, you know what, Jerry Smith just walked in the door, and it quickly sends me a tweet or it quickly sends me a message and says, Jerry, welcome to Home Depot, and uh, by the way, I, I noticed that you were checking out uh, whatever it was, snowblowers online, you know. Snowblower is located over here, and we've got a deal on those right now, you know. So, uh, or we'll give you, you know, a 10% off discount because you're one of our, you know, you're one of our loyal customers coming into the store today. I think it's more than just messaging. I think it is now analytically understanding where customers are, uh, through GPS tracking, through the Internet of Things, and our ability then to be able to interact with customers so that our brand, as I said earlier, is part of that consideration set. And therefore, I have the Home Depot app on my iPhone. And when I walk in, it knows that Jerry is there. And uh, so I think that that is a key part of our research. In, in, in addition to, as you say, um, looking at the content, the varied kind of content that we have. And I think, too, looking at how consumers engage. What does engage mean? I think the cognitive dimensions of digital now are so important versus sort of the passive and attitudinal dimensions, which, by the way, is not to diminish those attitudinal dimensions. The brand relationship is essential. But now the digital customer relationship is, is just as, or perhaps I think even more essential as we go on in the next kind of five to ten years. Jerry, that, that's great. I absolutely agree with you. I think that whole notion of um, what are the active measures and indicators of engagement, it, there's, there's a real opportunity for us to learn more about that as well. Um, your Home Depot example brings up a question that, that we've been hearing a lot from our members. Um, over the past year, and as we think about the disruption um, that's happening in so many industries, um, one of the questions that comes up is, how can big brands remain authentic and relevant when particularly in, among the millennial generation, but true for all generations as well, there's this sense that you know, a small niche startup brand almost is naturally imbued with authenticity and trust and relevance, whereas some traditional big brands um, are less trusted just because they have longevity. Um, any thoughts on how uh, your, your consumer empowerment really fits to, you know, and I think your monopoly example is an interesting example. How do you take a legacy brand or a strong brand uh, particularly in consumer packaged goods, and, and how do you stay authentic and relevant in this environment? Well, certainly um, UGC is one way to do that, is to try and get close to your customers. And so, um, you know, engaging with customers, letting them create content for you. I mentioned the uh, Crash the Super Bowl by, uh, by Doritos. Um, or Starbucks, you know, I mean, Starbucks, uh, has something they call a My Starbucks Ideas website. And you know, you can go and paste your ideas on their, you know, on the website about what you like or don't like or what you think they should do. I think that's a way to get authentically closer to consumers to let them have their voice. And so Starbucks will say, you know, we're going to take some of these great ideas, we'll vote on them, we'll let people vote on them right here, the ones we like, we'll then implement. That brings authenticity. I think you're so right. Uh, you know, Spotify is one of those kind of homegrown brands that has grown into now a terrific music streaming service. Apple has come along with Apple Music. Apple's terrific. You know, it, I think it's now probably has, um, I, think, as I, look, I think last time I saw it was maybe half of what Spotify has, you know, but it's catching up quickly. Apple's a big brand. Uh, Spotify's a small brand. Um, but, you know, I, I think you're right, especially millennials, they are distrustful. I do talk about trust in Chapter 1 of the book, and I'm actually amazed. I cited a, a study by Nielsen. They do a, a trust study for every year, and trust is incredibly important. But what's interesting with trust is that in the digital world, consumers are much more likely to use digital things because you know, the digital is just so easy to work with. Whether they trust it or not, 
they go ahead and use it. They're more trusting of just doing digital things, even as they're suspicious about, about brands and their brand relationships. So I guess I don't know if I answered that well, but I think that you really need to be close to your customers, and their brands do that very well. I think that notion of um, – that's a really interesting notion that, that people trust digital whether or not they trust the brand, brand. I think that they trust the technology. I think that's a really interesting, interesting uh, point of view. Uh, I think we have time for one last question, and this one came up early in your talk, and I want to make sure we get to it. I apologize, we may not get to all the questions, but um, you can send them separately to Jerry at his email if we haven't gotten to it, and he'll get back to you. But this question, Jerry, is we know a lot about how to measure brand loyalty and customer lo or brand loyalty and brand equity. Um, how do we measure this notion that you've been talking about today, this customer-driven loyalty? Um, what, what metrics do you see emerging to help us get a sense of whether a um, customers are connecting with the brand in the way that you talk about? So surely all of the measures that we have currently that we measure brand loyalty, those are important and they provide one aspect of, of this picture of loyalty. Um, consumers being aware of consumer beliefs about performance, uh, and, you know, measurements of feelings and affect and so forth, and intent to purchase. Those are all very, very important. I call those customer perception measures. But now there are other measures as well that we have to bring in. Uh, and, and some of these come from the old world of customer loyalty, uh, customer retention, uh, customer lifetime value we talked about. But now opt-out. And what is it about opt-out? And why do customers opt-out? What, what kind of opt-out are we doing? We need more of that. That is part of the loyalty picture. But then there's also a social dimension. This is part of measuring whether consumers really do feel like they're loyal to the brand and the brand is loyal to them. To what extent do they engage with brands and which brands are influential with them in a social media sphere? Who do they follow and who do they, who do they have in their, you know, in their social media sphere? And then, of course, we have sort of the old measures of customer experience, and I think there's a lot more work that needs to go on in customer experience measurement. I mean, we have customer satisfaction that's been around for many years, tried and trusted, of course, or the net promoter score, uh, you know, from the customer loyalty work of the last kind of 20 years. Uh, customer effort scores, those are important. So I view this uh, customer-driven uh, loyalty construct as being measured not in one way, but as really being measured in multidimensional uh, ways, you know, from social to traditional brand measures to then customer value measures, you know, which includes opt-out and, and uh, customer lifetime value, and then some of the customer experience measures. We could do lots of work in each of those areas. Jerry, Jerry, that's great. Um, I, I want to just take a moment, and, and I know this sounds really funny, but I really want to thank you for writing this book. Um, I had the opportunity in preparation for the webinar to, to read through the book, and I have to say um, one of the things that struck me is you've got a level of depth and rigor um, with your primary data and just how widely read you are as well and bringing in academic research that um, I thought made it a really good fit for MSI. Um, I, I think you're, you're thinking really broadly and deeply about topics that so many um, marketers are struggling with. And so um, I, I just really want to commend you for this and for those on the call, it was really fun. I mean, I, I watched Jerry working on this book for the last two years because uh, our offices are right next to each other at Boston College and uh, it was a lot of work and a lot of travel and a lot of analysis. So um, congrats on that. And I want to thank you for uh, presenting the webinar and um, to our members, if Jerry didn't get to your questions or if there are additional things you'd like to discuss with him, um, please feel free to reach out to him at his email address, which should be still right there on the screen, gerald.smith Gerald at bc.edu. Our next webinar will be, How Can MSI Help You Become an Even Better Marketer? with Kate Gray, our Director of Corporate Communications. Uh, it'll be April 21st at 1 p.m. We look forward to seeing you there. 
And many thanks to the members of the MSI audience for participating in our Member to Member webinar series.